Does anybody else want to introduce this time? I think that's... You're good for that, right? Hello, and... <laughs> I like making fun of the typical podcast intro voice. Oh, God, there's some Let's Player that does that. It's like, uh, what's that? Isn't it like Jack Sepulchre or something like that? Who's like, yeah. you know, hello, everybody. <laughs> welcome to the episode. Blah, 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 blah. It's just hey, like, it it, I you guess it works. Yourself. I guess, yeah. Bring in real energy to the first 15 seconds. Now, the best is when they do that when they get a new sub. Like, they just say the same, like, rehearsed line 50 times. Oh, like streamers stream. doing that? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I don't even watch gaming streams. Oh, hey, uh, so and so. Welcome to the. Welcome to the Pat Club, you know, we got the enjoy your emotes, oh, blah, yeah. blah, blah, There's always going to be a name for the community, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the opposite it, of what I do, where they, they're, they like, fostering the parasocial relationship. <laughs> yeah, the, YouTube though. will actually recommend that. You come up with some catchphrase uh, that people remember you by, come up with a, a name of your community. It's, like, by the book. I think they based it off of Ray William Johnson or something like that. I don't know. It's, like, it's a bunch of... Uh, just really tired YouTube tropes, but they actually tell you to do that to increase your audience. It's kind of stupid. It's it, it's so disingenuous. Well, if That's you're in basic. a highly competitive market like Let's Plays, then I can imagine that you need some kind of trick to keep yeah. people interested. All right, so welcome to the Long Form Analysis and Retrospectives podcast, episode two. I hate that name. Um, <laughs> I'm Patrician TV. Got my co-hosts Tetramore and Private Sessions here, and our guest Indigo Gaming. Uh, basically, the reason that I started this show, since you asked me about doing a podcast. So, oh, well, that's flattering. Uh, I think you had a you have a from what I saw your live streams, you have a really nice presentation, uh, collective thoughts. You don't ramble or stutter like I do, um, and yeah, it seems like a be good format. Hopefully, it works out for you. So, do you want to kind of introduce yourself? I mean, you're the big cat in here, but there's going to be some people who don't know what you do. Yeah, I mean, there's probably, I know there's some crossover between our audiences, but yeah, not everyone's going to know. So, I'm Indigo Gaming. Um, I started my channel about five, five and a half years ago, uh, primarily covering RPGs, but um, I've done all sorts of things, covered shooters, uh, retro gaming uh, documentaries, you know, I've done a couple retrospectives on uh, 90s uh, defunct developers and things like that. Um, my Probably my most famous work is the uh, technically feature length uh, Elder Scrolls, sort of my take on the Elder Scrolls slash documentary of the history. And kind it's comprehensive. Of, it's not just the Howard games. <laughs> the Howard games, yeah. No, I, I go way back all the way to the origins of the uh, arena, some of the mobile games people don't remember for like Nokia phones and stuff like that. Uh, the spinoffs that nobody wants to remember, like Red Guard and um, I completely blanked on the ba uh, Battle Spire. Yeah. Um, all those sort of old games all the way up through Oblivion, uh, obviously Morrowind Oblivion, Skyrim, and a little bit into ESO without getting too much into the details or the expansions. So it was meant to be a kind of comprehensive look at the series, where it started, where it headed, and, and I tried to kind of document the major changes along the way. Um, but I've also done sort of a shorter but similar thing with the Fallout series. And more recently, I've done a three-part, um, hopefully one day a five-part uh, look at like the uh, pretty comprehensive, probably the most comprehensive documentary on the cyberpunk genre. You know, books, comics, movies, games, all that kind of stuff. Just like the entire genre go, dating back to the the og stuff so try to keep it fresh um a lot of retro gaming mostly um whether it's reviews retrospectives i've gotten, I've gotten into kind of doc, long form documentaries as of late last couple of years so that's kind of my gig right now yeah i saw the first part of that cyberpunk uh documentary that you made and you said it four parts when you uh ended that one so you yeah, find some more uh, material I'm a goddamn liar. No, um, what happened is that part, I originally conceived it as one video. It was supposed to be one 45 minute video, but then I dug into it and I started putting together a list of titles that I have to cover and it got over a hundred and I was like, this has got to be much longer. So what I did is like, if I were to make it in one episode, it would be like the length of one of your videos. Right. So, uh, what I designed and your videos are really well made, but I, I think I might a lot of stuff I cover, I don't have any visuals for, so it takes a long ass time yes. to like come up with interesting visuals for like a five second segment. So 
what I decided to do is I, I decided to break it up into four episodes, one per decade, one starting uh, from the origins up through the 80s, one for the 90s, one for the 2000s, one for the 2010s. Um, the 90s was so dense uh, that I, I had to break that script into two. So that, therefore, it's right now looking at five episodes. So um, we're now up, uh, caught up through the 90s. Um, the next episode will hopefully be the 2000s. The last episode will be the 2010s. And maybe like a little bit of a blurb about Cyberpunk 2077. But obviously that game didn't wasn't received and wasn't quite the game changer that it was meant to be. So I don't know if I'll get into it that much. Private, have you played Cyberpunk? Yeah, I did. Um, yeah. I never really finished it, though. Oh, you didn't play it too comprehensively? Uh, no, I got like, I don't know, halfway through, I think. Yeah, so I reviewed Cyberpunk, and I actually thought about doing a one year after the fact video on that game and as I was playing it and getting footage I realized I was pretty much right the first time all that's changed is the bugs but since I didn't really talk about it too much in the video um, that means that the video doesn't really need sort of an update Cyberpunk well, is a really average game didn't they um I think they said that uh they're like done doing like bug fixes and everything and the next thing that's going to be coming out for it is going to be like major content stuff so they still have plans to add content and everything so that video might be better later down the line but yeah the first year it just seems like they were just fixing bugs and stuff like that yeah patricia and i or pat i did the same thing i i didn't well, i didn't do a video on cyberpunk but i uh, did a live stream a year after the fact um i last played it in february and i just replayed it um week or two ago and aside from the bugs gameplay is basically identical so they haven't really done, changed anything design wise just stabilized it a bit i still ran into some weird bugs here and there like weird physics uh you know a car appearing inside of my car things like that but uh definitely more of a stable experience but other than that like the mission design is exactly the same the gameplay is exactly the same they've not changed any of that well i'm and not I, there's a lot of yeah. foundational problems with cyberpunk oh yeah with the way that they've kind of built the game up i will say there's some great stuff about it it is definitely a, a trip if you're into i'm not into cyberpunk as much as i'm into synthwave and so yeah. it feels like driving through a synthwave album uh like the album cover art and stuff but yeah i mean the the world they built is incredible um they've got some interesting lore i mean a lot of that's kind of pulled from the tabletop uh game and um i totally forgot his name right now but the creator of the original tabletop game um but yeah the visuals are when they actually work they're incredible the and uh the story especially like the first act of the game story is actually pretty damn good in my opinion it kind of loses some steam after the incident i don't want to spoil too much for people who do, will play the game but after the incident which kind of changes things up but i think that the first act especially certain characters in there are really really well done but uh the gameplay, unfortunately, is very kind of skin deep there. I think that uh, people have been clamoring for me to do a video about it, but I'm just not really that interested in doing it right now. But maybe down the road, I'll do a video on it. But I, I honestly think that they should have borrowed more from Deus Ex in, in terms of especially level design. Scenario and level design is where it's really the weakest. I remember in one sequence where I was uh, completely ghosting it, as I would in something like uh, Thief or... Uh, Prey or Deus Ex and then I got to one segment and no matter what I did I'd walk into a square zone and immediately the alarms would go off and all enemies were aware of my presence just like that and it was like the most shallow uh, way to increase tension whatsoever uh, yes. and there was like no way to avoid that fight and I was just at that point I'm like okay they've completely failed in level design at this point because uh, there's entire uh, ways of playing the game th with stealth, but they just completely remove that option from the table. Kind of like Little Lamplight, like we were talking about early before the stream. So, Yeah, all I saw was the first part, and I had to stop a couple times. And it's mo mostly because I kind of have an issue with cyberpunk as a genre. Um, Tetra, did you see the later parts? Of the cyberpunk documentary? Yes. No. Oh, I, I was watched... I watched almost all of it. Okay, um, so after... I'll leave the later parts up to you, but for part one, it felt really like a childish, as nicely as that can be, nihilistic kind of look at the future. 
sort of like a lazy Black Mirror episode. I mean, obviously it's the 80s, so we've had 40 years to um, figure out what was right and what was wrong. But I have a hard time with that early cyberpunk stuff because it's very cynical. Yeah, um, it's it, there's a definite tone shift in the 90s. Uh, I think after Total Recall made a ton of money, um, they realized that they can kind of kind of fancy and dress things up a bit, make it a bit more exciting and sell a lot more tickets to the, to the theaters. So a lot of the movies in particular got a little bit more showy, especially with something like The Matrix. That was, uh, you know, some deep ideas, but kind of hidden behind crazy mind blowing stunts and action shootouts and things like that. So, but yeah, the earlier stuff, uh, very cynical, kind of reflective of the times. A lot of the people were pretty dis uh, kind of, uh, alienated by the Uber corporate yuppie sort of, you know, corporate culture that people saw at the time, big corporations just selling them garbage through ads and television. So a lot of that was kind of reflected in the time. You'll definitely see a reflection of, the times in, in each of these eras of, of work, but I could see that being kind of uh, at least the visual stuff. I mean, I think there were some really, really good novels back in the day. I think Neuromancer is still one of my favorite books, but uh, the, the motion pictures and stuff, uh, aside from Blade Runner, I think Blade Runner still holds up really well in terms of its sort of uh, theme of dehumanization and the idea that uh, considering le uh, certain class or group less than human is a way to moralize uh, essentially uh or amoralized you know doing horrible things to them slavery and whatnot but uh yeah well it was unusual to me because i'm somebody who like really resonates with dystopia fiction typically you're 1984 you're fahrenheit 451 brave new world and i've always been bothered by cyberpunk because it feels like dystopia fiction but with dystopia fiction, it's almost like the author always has an ideal vision of the future. It's just they're not portraying it. With cyberpunk, it just feels like the person is nihilistic and is trying to just air their issues. It's sort of like um, I was thinking about like Johnny Silverhand would be a cyberpunk writer if he was born 40 years earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's definitely a sort of uh, letting out frustration with the world. I, I would say that uh, there's a lot of like anti-capitalistic, obviously anti-capitalistic messaging in there. Um, some of it is is just uh, anti-authoritarian in general. You know, uh, government get off my back. Don't you know push us down. Whatever. Uh, I had an interesting point about that. I forgot. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a it's a little bit of edgy boy stuff. Um, there's some good themes in there too, but. Uh, it really kind of depends. It, there's there's sort of a, a line, I think, between stuff that wears cyberpunk as sort of a interesting and, and compelling shell and stuff that actually digs into problems of our culture. Oh, I just remember what I was thinking of. I, I forgot who does the who said this quote, but um, there was something, some really good quote, I think it was by Clark or, or uh, somebody like that. I, I have to look it up again. But one of the things that really kind of struck home with me is that um, the reason science fiction is so popular is that quite often it talks about real world issues that the civilization is currently experiencing. But instead of just preaching at them and saying, oh, home, you know, homelessness problem bad or, you know, taxes too high bad or whatever, they take a problem and put it into a completely alien context. So people can look at this problem in a very different uh, setting and context from our world and see the issues at hand and kind of, uh, because it's so different from our world and disconnected, they don't feel it as, as preachy or they don't feel it as uh, pandering. So they just kind of, uh, they're able to kind of relate better weirdly enough because it's disconnected from our world. And I think that was the original idea of sci-fi is taking real world issues into a very uh, futuristic or foreign uh, context so that people could identify the problems better. Because when you see the problems in our, days in and out you know every single day of your life you kind of just kind of accept it but if you see the problems in a different context you're able to kind of identify the problem and potentially see solutions better at least that's the idea i think yeah so um it basically lets you uh get ideas out there without the reader imparting their own biases onto the world and the events and stuff and um as somebody who's done creative writing and stuff this is something that i've actually come across a few times 
where you'll be planning something and simple things like you're, you're talking about like um like a, a civil war or something like that. If you use North and South, automatically there's going to be people who start, you know, applying American history and stuff like that to it. East and West, you get into Cold War and things. And it's just like little biases that people will carry into different uh, works of fiction. So science fiction kind of lets you, and fantasy too, lets you apply, you know, like a sort of filter that distances the, um, distances the people, distances the audience away from the events enough so that hopefully they'll look at it with a, with less personal biases. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I'm not as good unscripted as scripted. I could probably write it in a more eloquent way, but that's exactly what I was saying. Like a um, great example of that would be like the expanse, for example, instead of using North, South, East, West, they use uh, earthers, um, the, uh, uh, what do they call the inners or uh, like that? The, there's the Martians, they're the, uh, people that are the belters and then the earthers, right? The three different sort of main factions at the beginning of the series. And they, those are kind of placeholders of the upper class, the military, uh, the sort of blue collars and things like that. The class struggle between these different uh, sort of tiers of civilization. And it works great because it's, it's disconnected enough from our reality that we don't, like you said, uh, impart our own biases against one or the other. And it's still preachy. It's still obviously imparting a message, but um, it's disconnected enough from our reality that I think it, it, it makes the message go down easier, I think. So I will ask this uh, as a last question to the cyberpunk part. Did you intend for each kind of episode of that documentary to be a yearly thing? Because they're almost 12 months apart from each other. No, not at all. Um, I had some uh, health problems, writer's block. Um, I... I think let's see at the after the first episode did really really well i i think i got some sort of uh kidney issue had to go surgery and around that time i wasn't feeling great and i had complete uh writer's block for a few months right I decided to put the series on hold i did it i covered an old uh game from the 90s and sort of a stop gap just to kind of get my uh i really hate the expression but get my creative juices working again and then, uh, then I went back and finished the script. And then, because the script uh, became so huge, I uh, like I started writing part three um, early 2020. Um, part three and part two were written together, and uh, and I split them, and then finished up part two after like a long sort of long gestation period. And I was ready to basically start on part three right after part two, but that ended up becoming a freaking beast, and it's my long, longest scripted video yet. So that's why that one took so long. But it was meant to be. It was actually originally meant to be done by the time Cyberpunk 27 came around, even though I literally in, did not intend to cover the game in any shape or form. It was meant to... My, my entire purpose for the series was to prevent the genre of Cyberpunk being overwritten by the game, actually. I've hinted at that before, but that was my entire point. I, I didn't want the genre to be erased by a single franchise. So you So the video was made like in response to cyberpunk 2077 basically or at least the marketing yeah yeah and it, and it helped get the a lot of views especially on the part one the part one definitely got the most views and probably will remain that way but uh it wasn't meant to piggyback like i never mentioned the game once and by name in the entire series so far four and four, four and a half hours of video i never mentioned the game once so it's not piggybacking on the game but it is sort of a response to the intentional or not sort of uh, erasure of the genre for the game, if that makes sense. Uh, that's interesting because like, um, I really don't have much exposure to cyberpunk as a genre. Out you know, I've heard of the term and stuff like that, but um, outside of like, you know, the cyberpunk game, uh, so going in and watching like your whole uh, documentary series, like really uh, brought attention to like a lot of different, like just, books movies and stuff like that that i've never even heard especially the movies never even heard of most of those movies and i didn't realize how big the genre actually was and i thought that what we're seeing now is like a resurgence of cyberpunk when in fact you were saying that uh it's almost like on a down downturn right now um yeah i think it has gotten a resurgence um the my original titles for all four epi it was supposed to be four episodes um were the origins of cyberpunk, uh, the evolution of cyberpunk, 
uh, the decline of cyberpunk and the reboot of cyberpunk. Those are my, going to be my four titles because I think that 2010s definitely saw a big upturn, you know, with indie games, with uh, Blade Runner 2049. Uh, you've got shows like Electric Dreams. You've got shows like uh, Altered Carbon, uh, Upgrade, things like that. Like we saw a really big comeback. And there was a big music movement around it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Synth, synth Wave got really, really popular. Um, you got a lot of that sort of, you got all these cyberpunk playlists. It was just like tons of crazy uh, synth stuff. And, and then the, the 80s aesthetic got popular again, which also helped because uh, the original idea of cyberpunk was kind of retro futurism, where it's, you've got the 80s kind of blocky uh, sort of DeLorean like style applied to future tech, like flying cars and whatnot. So it kind of goes hand in hand. It was a, a bunch of different things going on, but I definitely think that a 2010s got, was a resurgence, but I, I feel at least my narrative is that a 20, 2000s was started out strong with like Deus Ex, um, things like that. Um, arguably a minority report with Tom Cruise, but then it kind of took a decline toward the end of the decade. So that was my, that's my, my narrative at least. To kind of pivot into the previous episode, uh, we talked a lot about ways that we could improve workflows for this sort of genre because so i did the count today i will edge out at 10 videos this year because i have a christmas video coming out and i there's a lot of us who we, we have this issue of we release less than one video a month do you think one of the proposals we had was like if you had sort of other creators that you could work with do you think that there was some part of your process that could have been made easier through collaborative effort? Ooh, um, that's an interesting question. Um, I've only done, well, I guess I've technically done a few collaborations now since uh, another creator who actually was a, a watcher before um, we started talking and he was into uh, various things like Vampire the Masquerade and, and Cyberpunk and we're like, hey, maybe we should uh, co-write this. and. I've always kind of spearheaded the the video. It's definitely my video, but he's definitely helped bounce ideas off of and and helped like flesh out some of the script and stuff like that. Um, so, by at the time he was going by Shalarshaska, but unfortunately he had to change his name because his uh, Google was automatically correcting that to the uh, Metal Gear Solid character. Um, so we started kind of fleshing that out. That, but my first collaboration was actually a, a complete disaster. I. Um, I was going to do a two-part uh, video on Final Fantasy VII with, uh, what is his name, Downward Thrust. And uh, it started out fine, but then in the middle of that, he had a video go viral and then set, instead started uh, outsourcing his writing to um, just some unpaid fan, I guess. And he ended up just pulling entire paragraphs from Pat Holloman's books about uh, reverse design and Pat Holloman's an amazing dude. He's actually making his own uh, uh, Japanese RPG, Japanese style RPG now. Uh, and he was cool about it, but he eventually brought it to my attention that some scripts, uh, some of my script and uh, some of Downward Thrust script, actually I think it was all, all in my side of the script, was uh, plagiarized because the writer just pulled entire paragraphs. So I was pretty burned by that since everything else I did was completely original. Um, so I kind of cut ties with him after that. Uh, uh, it wasn't his intention, but he just didn't, he, he just outsourced to, to some writer who just didn't care. So but, it, um, it ended up being a bad idea because of the ethics of the person involved. Yeah. Um, the, the lack of care or attention and, uh, but yeah, I mean, honestly, collaborations require a lot more, uh, double checking. Like, you know, do you like this idea? Do you like that idea? You have to, you have to schedule, uh, you know, Skype calls, discord calls, things like that. I, I imagine there's a time and a place where collaborations could uh, definitely benefit um, turnaround. And pro it most certainly for me helped with uh, motivation, for sure. When I was uh, working with Charles Shaska, now he's known as Cult of the Cyber School. Um, so I can see it could definitely be helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know how your workflow works, but uh, mine's like um, probably 30% script uh, 10, 20 percent voiceover, voiceover editing, and like 50 percent just rock solid editing, just tons and tons and tons and tons of editing. It sounds um, similar, probably 45, yeah. 45, 10 for me. Um, 
Well, okay, so I want to contrast that with my collaboration experience where I usually just give them a prompt and go. And I've typically relied on uh, people's credibility when it comes to um, are they doing it ethically or right. I'm not going to be big on on checking the people I work with. Um, one of the people I collaborated with is Tetramore, and he did half of our Metal Gear Survive video. And that helped the turnaround immensely because he was much more knowledgeable about Metal Gear Solid as a series than I was. And so he was able to kind of cover things that I wouldn't have been able to cover. So do you think, I mean, plagiarism's obviously going to be an issue. You're tied to it if you approve it. But do you yeah. really think that's fair? Because there's not, you know, it's something that you're going to find out after the fact. Yeah, um, you really have to kind of run it through. I mean, even plagiarism checkers don't seem to be uh, perfect. I After the fact, I took my script that was like mo uh, all my sections were written by myself. But there were like there was like one chapter about I think it was storyline or something like that that uh, had been lifted pretty much word for word minus my grammar edits, actually. Uh, from Pat Holloman's book, and I was, uh, I ran that through a plagiarism checker and it, it, it ran, ran up blank. So I think there's a certain fault there in that if it's not a wide enough public release, um, you, you know, plagiarism checkers aren't, aren't perfect either. So uh, obviously, you just have to find somebody that you trust. The plagiarism and, uh, checkers we have access to aren't perfect because I work with people who teach writing professionally and they have access to plagiarism checkers that are amazing. I mean, immense yeah. academic databases of submitted student essays that they can look at and make sure that nobody's cheating. Yeah, like my school, they every single submission that you make, I, I've submitted like 10 essays this, uh, this semester. All of them get registered into a database. So every single thing somebody writes gets entered into their database. It's pretty crazy. That sounds awesome. But there's even ways to get around that, though. Um, I actually... Yeah, uh, I, I'm aware. For this. Yeah, there's a thing called Quillbot, and they recommend... They say right on there, say, don't use this for plagiarism. But um, I used it for... Uh, it's actually a great tool if you're kind of stuck on a sentence. You don't know how to reword it. Um, it's an AI sentence restructurer, so it basically use different words, different structure, and some of it's actually quite good. And you can also use it to uh, expand, make make your writing more verbose, make it briefer. I actually uh, I took my last script for Cyberpunk Part Three and took it from something like twenty one, twenty two thousand words to about down to about seventeen thousand words. Same exact meaning, just more condensed sentences. I went line by line by line with the help of an AI. Uh, Rewriter, obviously, I, sometimes I would take its advice, and I'm saying I would not. But you know, I, I with with that um, aid, I was able to condense down my script by a lot because I figured that I the shorter the script, the more condensed, the less run-on sentences, the and also less editing in the back. I was end. gonna say the last thing we need is more verbosity, needless verbosity, <laughs> anyways. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I would assume that if you could take a, a an essay uh, and run it through. Quillbot, you could probably come up with something undetectable, but not that I encourage that. I think that's wrong, but it is a possibility. So I guess, do you want to get into uh, talking about this stream I did on your video? Yeah, sure. So I re-watched I re it, um, and I'm going to be completely honest. Of all the people that I covered, I think you got off in the middle. I'm not going to say light, but I will say that like a lot of the stuff I was pinning on to you was mostly just general issues I was having with um, with Skyrim videos that we were watching. So if you're sure. here from Indigo and you're not familiar with me, I did a series of Skyrim streams where I watched videos and took notes on them um, and, you know, was live reacting to them. So I watched Indigo's Elder Scrolls and A Promise Unfulfilled video, but just the Skyrim part mostly. So, uh, is there anything in particular you kind of wanted to respond to? Um, I don't know if I made it through the entire stream. Um, yeah, it was like two and a half hours long. Yeah, I, I there were some points I think I'd mentioned over chat, but I'll reiterate them here. Um, one of the points was valid in that one shot. I think it's of the uh, blades guy at Boris the very end of in Oblivion. Um, yeah, yeah, the very end of the tutorial dungeon in Oblivion. 
that shot is from my modded live stream. So that, that one shot is weird. The colors are different. His face is different. Yeah, it's like an E and um, B mod and like a skin retexture, I think. Yeah, it looks funky. I, I should have just gone back and replayed the tutorial. For some reason, I didn't have footage of that exact shot. Um, and uh, I, like you, try to cover, try to show what I'm talking about. So when I can't find the right three second clip for half a sentence, I mm, go crazy. Yes. And that's all I had access to. So I, I literally cropped out a little like 720p window from my live stream. Uh, when I played modded and I put that in there, I should have gone back and just re-recorded re that whole area. But I was like, I well, think like a, two months into editing. I don't know if you have to apologize to for it because that's the sort of thing that only we are going to notice. The people who right. are in this call, you know, content creators are going to notice that. Most people aren't going to notice that, and even if they do, they're not going to have issues with it because there's kind of a it's a debate about whether or not you should include modded footage in videos and I feel like that was overrepresented when I talked about your video because yeah it was weird it was mostly speculation on what you had done to Skyrim to get those uh, skill levels that you had yeah and I think I there was one shot in my Morrowind section where I pulled from my live stream as well um, I just needed a shot of somebody running fast because I remember one of my favorite things about Morrowind was the uncapped skills for the most part, and that you could make your guy run insanely fast and jump like two store, you know, three zones of, uh, or whatever, you know, it's make an insanely powerful character. And I didn't have any of that footage on hand. So I pulled a quick clip from my live stream where I had, uh, used the console command to bump my speed up to like 150 or something like that. Um, just as a quick visual when I was saying that you can make your character, uh, run as fast as Usain Bolt or something like that. So that was, modded shot um i think everything else was just purely i even used the dos versions of all the games to record i uh was very careful about that like like um yeah i, I originally gotten some flack when i had used some modded footage in one of my older videos back from 2016. somebody pointed out it's like why are you using modded footage for a documentary i'm like that's a good point but it stuck in that one i was honestly just at that at the point in time that was like a three and a half month project i think and at the time, three and a half months for a video was an insane amount of time. Obviously, that's changed. <laughs> now it seems short. Right. But uh, yeah, no, it wasn't my intention to uh, misinterpret the game. And all my critique was based on the vanilla versions. Well, of each game. I mean, I, I don't see a reason to really be apologetic about it because it's, it's one of those things where every time you do something professionally, you have to do a cost benefit analysis of whether or not it's a good idea. And so sometimes you have to ask yourself, I need to get this video out. Is it worth five minutes to record something new? Or is it worth two minutes to use something that I have that might not necessarily be best? Yeah, this happens in movies a lot. I think there's uh, some scene in Star Wars where they reuse footage just wholeheartedly and for the Death Star or something. I, I wanna say either t you see the same clip twice in the original movie or uh, shots from uh, New Hope were reused in Return of the Jedi or something like that. But I remember something about that where they just completely reused a shot. Um, they've done it in the Star Trek movies. I think there you see the same uh, ship blow up in different movies. They just, that was that was exactly right. The cost, cost benefit analysis, uh, it'd be a lot cheaper if we just reuse that shot and most people won't notice. So, you know, that's what they did. Well, I so. think there's, there's prudence in that because it, 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 we can be nitpicky all we want, but I think faster videos is more videos, and more videos is preferable to, like, n more 99% videos is better than uh, few 100% videos. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, good point. Like, I, obviously, my, I have bias. I'm not going to ever deny that I have bias, but, uh, you know, my bias definitely shines through in some of my videos. I've tried to keep the Cyberpunk videos fairly opinion-free, but, you know, if you never mention anything about the quality of anything, any sort of subjective quality of anything, your writing tends to be pretty, pretty bland. So yeah, uh, a couple of opinions, uh, especially if you're through, giving but, like the same amount of real estate to like for Blade Runner as like some anime from the eighties that did what didn't do that well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm you not, have to have a little bit of opinion in there. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I probably should have given a little bit more respect to Akira, but um, things like Bubblegum Crisis, I'm, me and like 20 other people remember that show, but the, like Blade Runner, um, Ghost in the Shell, uh, The Matrix, those are going to obviously get, get a lot more screen time because they were uh, a lot more important, a lot more beloved, and a lot more sort of milestones of the genre. So that's obviously I tried to put more time into those. But uh, yeah, I mean, my, my uh, actually my marker, I was going to say actually, my marker for quality is like if I get 95% of it right, <laughs> which I don't know if I've na uh, nailed that each time, but I try to check my facts. I try to double check across multiple, you know, my experience uh, versus a couple different databases or, you know, US UESP, you know, for Elder Scrolls or wikis or uh, ideally going through the uh, actual sources and reading the sources because quite often Wikipedia uh, editorials are way, way too condensed to really get the meaning of the original source. So. Whenever I can, I try to source the original material and try to get a really good idea of what it was meant. But, you know, in the in the grand scheme of things, there's always going to be a couple errors. I, I have like four errors in Cyberpunk Part 1, just like factual things like I said Dreamcast when I meant Sega Saturn. Or, you know, I, I, I uh, said uh, that Ghost in the Shell was set in um, Hong Kong when it was actually set in a fictional city in Japan, but it was modeled after Hong Kong. So things like that. So minor stuff, but, you know try to get most of it but sometimes things slip through uh so that was the part that you acquiesced for the stream so were there parts that you sort of disagreed with my coverage um i remember you mentioned something like uh like i was hacking my character in skyrim um i don't know off the top of my head what was wrong with my stats but you mentioned something some of the skills didn't look right so yeah so what now, it was was you were level two and you had picked an orc and some of your skills were five which as far as i'm aware is not possible in vanilla skyrim i don't remember in skyrim i played i've played all the elder scrolls games not to brag just but but i don't remember which ones require you to sleep to level up or not i don't think you need to sleep in skyrim to level up is that right no you don't you do not yeah so that's weird that i would have skills higher than that because you can keep on getting oh, your skills no. up and it, more and more. It wasn't that they was higher than it should have been. It was that it was lower than it should have been. You should not be able to have a skill level of five in Skyrim at level two. I, I mean, I think you, there's like maybe drain effects, but maybe yeah. I, wouldn't the number show up red if that were true? Yeah, I think the number's red if that's the case. I'm pretty sure I ran it completely vanilla. Skyrim was recent enough that I didn't need to mod anything. The only thing, the only mod I used uh, in all the games was I had a widescreen patch for Morrowind because it's a lot easier to use widescreen footage. Yes. That's the only thing I actually uh, knowingly modded in any of the games. Uh, other than you're, that, talking the that, <laughs> you're talking to the guy that you're talking to the guy that recorded most of his Morrowind video on the Xbox. Oh boy, yeah. That's a lot of fun. I, I do have a capture card, but on, honestly, console recordings is a pain in the ass. Yes. Uh, I've done it a couple times, but it's not really worth it for the most part. Can you uh, turn yourself up, Tetra? I have you maxed out, and you're still quiet. Okie doke. Um, but yeah, I don't know how that was. Maybe I... It was just, I it was just no unusual. I, so it's like a still where you're zooming in and you you're blurring out you're like vignetting the rest of the screen and then um you're focusing on health stamina fatigue at the level up and that's what you're talking about is yeah. it possible that like you just pulled something from google images and it was like so there's a mod called uh what's this classic classes and birth signs it might have had like an image that you might have pulled there are occasional times where I'm, I scan through all my hours of footage and can't find a specific shot, and yes. I'll l try to find an unmodded screen cap. It is quite possible that I, I may have pulled something that I thought was unmodded but was. I mean, this, um, this is overstating it. Who cares? Yeah. You know, it's a it's not my intention. Obviously. Yeah, it's a background yeah. detail when the main po topic was um, the replacement of attributes. Yeah, like I, I, I popped in and watched a little bit of that uh, white light video, and I couldn't named the, the mods but some of that footage definitely was modded yeah so especially toward the end he's using so the like, ordinator perk mod okay yeah that's a little weird when you're talking about how great a game holds up and then modding it to he was it specifically talking okay. about how well it's 
perk system works and like yeah how rewarding it is to level up yeah no all my critique uh whether you want to call it correct or not was all based on the vanilla very very vanilla version of the game and if you've ever played daggerfall um you know it's got warts and all it's it's a it, it crashes you fall through walls you know sometimes the sound bugs out so i didn't want to pull the punches too much on that it, it was a very buggy game um and i did not uh i, I there's a, a smaller youtuber who did a really good analysis of um, daggerfall but I, I do kind of question his use of daggerfall unity which is a much more stable and less buggy version of the game and that that gives you kind of a, a false sort of uh idealized version of the game and i don't think that's exactly fair if you're talking about the game historically at least if you're just talking about how, playing the game in, in 2021 and saying hey i recommend playing daggerfall unity build um this is what the mods i used what etc that's fine but if you're talking about the game historically you should probably play the original was it uh elder scrolls 2 daggerfall 25 years later um i'm not sure it was by a jeweler um oh then I okay i thought you were talking about i thought you were talking about salty shrimp pasta's daggerfall video because he hangs around okay i'm not sure about i'm not familiar with that one i was watching a jeweler's video and i did no it's only I, it's only got 500 views so yeah this one got more than that but it uh i i recommended this video because it, it had a lot of good good information and it was a pretty good breakdown of the game a lot more time spent on that because he did like a four-part series on just one game but uh yeah no it was good but it was just i i did feel that the using essentially a mod in the case of uh daggerfall unity which is a complete engine rebuild using the unity engine it's a, it, it gives you the false impression see i don't know about the validity of, of that because it's like saying that um you can't talk about doom because you're using gz doom or you can't talk about morrowind because you're using open mw as as fair as it is to say that you should get the authentic experience, that becomes increasingly difficult over time as compatibility changes. I mean, you know, you'll always be able to play Daggerfall uh, with a virtual machine, or as long as DOS boxes continue to be functional. But there's a lot of older stuff that um, has to be emulated or has to be run through a source port that um, I don't think it's really fair to people to say that they have to play it authentically. Yeah, I mean, this was using some graphic UI mods, things like that. I don't know how modded he was. He probably was using fairly close to the basic game, but even the basic game in Daggerfall Unity has different physics than the basic game in DOS. Yes, I, I know that stood out to me immediately when I tried playing it. Yeah, so, I mean, it, I, I'd say it works better. Like, climbing is... Uh, leagues ahead of the DOS game. I, I would uh, quick save before every single time I try to climb anything because there's a good chance that you just fall through the wall <laughs> in the original game. And it's just something you kind of have to, you have to have a lot of patience with the original game. It's a unique experience, but, uh, and I'm not excusing it. It was just, it was very buggy. It was called, you know, unfortunately it was known as bugger fall for a while. To some people. Yeah, it was, fam it was famously buggy at the time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but, yeah, so I, from a historical perspective, I would prefer, and I did in my videos, use the original DOS version, but uh, the, it's just, it's, I guess it's the context. Like you were saying, uh, playing Daggerfall in its finest uh, form in 2021, that's perfectly fine. Use, use a DF Unity, use whatever mods make it more accessible, etc. You know, just, just I would but, just yeah, say, leave it at DF Unity. Yeah. But, um, My only issue with DF Unity is it has that um, that melee and doom problem of because you're fighting sprites, it's hard to make blows connect. Not in a Morrowind yeah. way where your stats are off, but in a <laughs> I don't know where the model is or the hitbox. Yeah, it is hard. I would actually say that this is a hot take, but I'd say that Daggerfall does it better than Morrowind because one thing that Morrowind's missing is hit but not damage yes. sound i've said daggerfall that oh yeah you, you have okay cool yeah no i i it's a hot take but i i'd say that daggerfall because it has the clang sound you know that you connected but you didn't hit it it, it um, either needs that sound effect or a dodge animation to yeah it's something because world of warcraft they, has that where if there's a dodge then the model will actually dodge to yeah show that. or a, some sort of blocking sound or something yeah even a blocking sound would be enough but you just don't even know if you're connecting or if you're if it was a miss on your skill check. I think there's a mod 
or a setting in Daggerfall Unity that turns it into the Oblivion style, where if you if you connect, you always hit, and skill just modifies damage. I don't know if it's in the vanilla game as a setting, or it might be a mod, but you can do that in Daggerfall, and that probably makes it a lot more accessible to newer players. Yeah, it's probably in like a repack or something. Yeah, probably. See, I don't know if Morrowind has a glancing blow state. I think it is just you either hit or you miss. Yeah, it's become literally a meme. I've seen like this the uh, uh, Bart and Homer uh, hitting, uh, <laughs> trying to hit Homer with a uh, chair, you know, meme or something with more windows. It's really funny, but yeah, it's become infamous because of that because it's really hard to tell if you're actually uh, actually trying to strike or if you're just not even close enough. Well, so. and part of the issue is that a lot of people just don't know how to play the game. Yeah, for sure. Especially if you come from Oblivion onward, you expect to to feel that impact regardless right. of your skill. And I get comments like um, a dice roll system has no place in an action system, which I think is very, uh, how, how do I put it, artistically restrictive. You should never really say anything like you should never do that because there's always a way that you could try and make it interesting. And to simply say that if you're doing an action system, the blows always have to connect. Yeah, uh, it's is limiting. It's kind of a uh, it's the sliding scale between character skill and player skill. Uh, the later games rely more on player skill in that for the you know, for the most part, a better player will get combat done, uh, get a better result in combat. Whereas in the other games, you're initiating the, the attack role. But if you're. Uh, long sword skill was five. You're not hitting anything, regardless of how skilled you are as a player. So, it, it, it leans more on the player's skill, uh, that being able to block, uh, you know, manual block, um, dodge, you know, things like that, versus an automated block check in like the original couple games. I think even as late as Morrowind, and uh, and skill check combat so it's 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 that sliding scale as as the games went on further obviously you get damage modifiers and whatnot but and added effects but uh you could kill a giant at level two or level one yes. I did it. so you know. just bob back and forth it's probably why they got rid of speed because that was oblivion's problem where it was there was too much incentive to level speed and then just manually dodge back and forth over and over especially as a mage just backtrack and yes. nobody can even keep up with you and then you're cutting and then you don't ever have to use target spells yeah so like, like there's go ahead uh so uh, like a big balance of mages is the 1.5 times uh modifier to magic it costs for target spells but you never have to use them because you can bump your speed up which is true in morrowind as well um, but if you're like running around, you lose fatigue. So then, you know, they, they thought of that in Morrowind at least. Yeah. Yeah. And there's definitely some, uh, quality of life and, and playability things that have been upgraded throughout the series. And I, I tried to highlight those some somewhat. If I, if I were to redo the video again today, I probably would be less harsh on Skyrim, uh, completely. I would have brought up more of its, if it's pros and things like that. I was. I think it ended up being a lot more positive about Oblivion than Skyrim, even though a lot of the problems in Skyrim are also uh, present in Oblivion. Um, yeah, but I one of my notes when I watched the stream was that you had said that Oblivion's intro was innovative and Skyrim's intro was bad, um, which I disagree with because they're basically the same. Yeah, they're a lot more the same. Uh, I think Oblivion wastes less of your time, or at least it, at least a lot of the stuff in Oblivion is dialogue, which I believe you can skip. But um, Skyrim was more of a timed intro, uh, and a lot of the stuff that you see in the Skyrim intro does not reflect on the game. Where I believe, I think Oblivion had a much better pace. You'd like do a fight, there'd be some talking, walk down the corridor, do another fight. It was a little bit more. It was introducing you. Uh, I, I think it maybe it just did it a bit more transparently, but it introduced you to each mechanic very well. Uh, there was a whole stealth section. There was a there was a fighting section. There was a spell casting section, and at the end, you get to reroll your character if you didn't if you uh, or build your character as you see fit. So I thought that was a great idea. And they would that's they one would of the guess. problems in a lot of RPGs is that you have no idea how good or how much you like playing a, a, a spellcaster or a rogue or everything like that. Like I would spend two hours in Baldur's Gate 
creating my perfect party and then realize I hated every character after like an hour. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think the other part of Oblivion's intro that's interesting is it guesses your class based on how you play. That was cool. I don't know how accurate it was, but it was cool. Yeah, I think like it's just see. it's based on what skills you level while you're in the tutorial. And since everything's at level five, you know, doing it like twice will level things up. So, yeah. yeah. That was kind of a thing. It was like you were forgiving Oblivion for stuff that Skyrim does, and then you would criticize that same thing in Skyrim. Um, so I'm sure you would patch that up because I think that was... Skyrim comes and goes with how hard people will go on it. Like, people are hard on it now, but I, I can see in two years people will go back to uh, praising Skyrim again. Yeah, everything goes through that, that phase. There's the... Um new honeymoon phase where oh my god this is the new the bestest new thing i love it and then like two or three years later it's like oh that thing is old and kind of bad and then by five years it was like wow i can't believe people like that thing and then by 10 20 you know 10 15 years like man wasn't it great when we had games like that <laughs> and it's just kind of a little yeah. irritating the classic Same thing with the classic bethesda year of you have to wait one year to get accurate videos about the games yeah it's it's almost like a window where you have to get out of the newness of a game and i've actually i've had this play out both ways um i've had games where uh after like i loved it in the when i first played it and then two or three years later i realized i didn't like it that much or the reverse a game gets so highly praised that you just get sick of even looking at the cover and but then you play it a few years later and like oh you know what uh now that the hype's kind of died down i actually kind of like this game it's just it's like the the initial reaction is can be really blinding so that's why i kind of like the uh, sort of uh race of vic style so and so year late years later and and i think white light's basically stolen that format <laughs> everybody everybody steals that format yeah i think race of vic kind of was one of the first ones to do it not that oh yeah copyright or anything or yeah was it, race of was it uh joseph anderson because he did that with fallout 4. i think race of vic did it while they're back in his uh, cog connected days back on halo oh yeah 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 with halo and mass effect yeah he's a cool dude i've i've done a podcast with him and and uh, he's a he's a really neat guy but uh yeah i it's not like it's copyright or anything but it no but it's seo gold it is seo gold yeah um but yeah it's a it's a good format i think because looking back at a game like everybody says oh man fought new vegas best game ever and then you go back and play it you know, 10 years later and you kind of see how it is and sometimes you're surprised you're really impressed with how well it holds up and other times you're like oh man i remember that half the game i spent doing blah and that kind of hated that i found that with some games and some games i've we yeah, have okay so what changes in the seven years later that like is no longer valid in the eight years later video uh i wouldn't say anything really um obviously graphics would get a little older um but see, I've never Mo bought the graphics argument. I mean, I, I, I like a good looking game more just as much as anybody, but I'm currently reviewing 25 to 30 year old games right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't really care. Uh, like, no, I, I'll say this bad, like ugly, repulsive graphics to me are a turnoff, but aesthetic is king to me. Like you can make a really, really, really good looking game that'll last 30 years. You know 30 plus years like there's games for the nes that i still think look good but um you know the, then there's games that were released yesterday that i think look kind of repulsive so it's just like if you have a clean aesthetic that's kind of consistent oh, man you, you brought know, up the any love. you brought up the nes that's a big uh authentic filter where oh you're not playing this nes game on a crt well you know that it was designed for a crt that would like split the pixel or whatever I don't know the technology behind it, but the CRT people uh, will will claim that like games look, games of that era look ten times better on a CRT versus a digital monitor. Yeah, and I, I've seen the comparisons, and there's a, definitely a truth to that. Like there, they would actually in the game development studios, they would actually they'd work on computers, obviously, um, which were CRT, but they were a bit different. But then they would test their games on a, a flat, old, blurry. Um, color bleeding TV just to see how it looks. And there's a lot of uh, good arguments for that. Like I, I remember distinctly seeing one sprite from uh, the PlayStation 1 game, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, where you see the actual sprite image for uh, Dracula's headshot. 
and there's like a single solid we're talking like two five five zero zero red just like solid red pixels two solid red pixels for eyes it looks kind of crappy um when you see the format or when you see the, like the pixel art on a high def screen but on a CRT, those red pixels bleed and it looks like his eyes are glowing and it looks awesome. So I can see the argument that uh, obviously the graphics were designed for the technology at the time. They didn't really have uh, backlit LCD screens for the most part back then, at least. And there might have been a couple laptops, whatever, but for the most part, they were using CRT screens for, the, for everything. And yeah, laptop screens back then were terrible. So uh, I think there's a good were... argument that they think they were early LCDs because I have a hard time imagining you carrying around a cathode ray tube. No, no, yeah, they were LCD. They were like very faintly backlit. Um, I, I think I had like an old, old ThinkPad once, and I was like, man, this is like 90, 90, 1997 or whatever. But the screens were very dull, and you didn't get very good color out of them. Um, the LCD crystals must have been just very opaque or something because there was they're very dull, not very good. So. Uh, honestly, you get great color and great contrast from CRT monitors even today. So some people prefer them. I'm not a, that much of a purist. Like I, I'm covering a bunch of Super Nintendo games and I'm emulating them because I figure that's a 99.9% .9 accurate uh, representation of the game. And it's a heck of a lot easier than getting a $500 version of the cart and an SNES and rigging it to work on HDMI so I get the high, highest res capture and all other crap. Like that just seems like a huge waste of time for a slightly uh you know different experience so yeah james rolf did his angry video game nerd thing at the exact right time for it to be cost effective i can't imagine it being possible to do that today no for a for a new youtuber i, I have a couple uh snes i even have a uh, <laughs> nerd cred i have a super famicom uh cart of uh chrono trigger i can't play it because i don't have a super famicom yeah. but i have one um i have a couple snes a couple nes carts but as cool as it is to dust those off and you know spend an hour wiping them down with alcohol to make sure that the copper connectors work it's it's more just kind of uh you know uh old school nerd cred than really anything i can download a game and play it within three minutes on emulator and i have an snes uh retro controller usb and everything like that and get a 99 percent authentic experience within like three minutes and i don't have to sp i don't have to spend like 500 dollars for a uh rip off collectible cart on ebay <laughs> yeah and, but you know how hobbyists are you gotta have yeah. as authentic experience as possible so um the next part of the stream that i have in my notes is i criticized your the way the order that you presented the lead design positions on skyrim in which is a very pedantic thing because I don't think it comes across like the connotation or the way it comes off to me. So like you were talking about the lead design positions, Ken Rolston uh, retired and then unretired worked on kingdoms of Amalur and an MMO and then re-retired. And then yeah. uh, Bruce Nesmith took over as the lead designer. Kurt Coleman took over as the co-lead designer and Emil Pagliarillo was a senior designer. But I think you presented the order backwards, where you presented Emil first because he says his name weird. Um, yeah, I, I every single pronunciation guide I found it's Emil, but everyone calls him Emil. He's the which... only person on the planet that takes that pronunciation. So, anyways, my uh, my kind of thing of it is if you present Emil first, it's like the implication is that. He's now just the lead design dog over at Bethesda when really his thing is Fallout. And I mean, he's he's important when he worked on he was important when he worked on Skyrim because he had his fingers and everything. But um, that was Bruce Nesmith's and Kurt Coleman's game. So it's, it's yeah. a minor thing. Yeah, I may have my the narrative of the video may have overstated his involvement in Skyrim and I do consider the Skyrim segment the most flawed of the of the video because I do kind of hit it pretty hard and it definitely more my bias kind of shines through. I think uh, if I were to redo it, I'd probably try to back those up with more claims, more interviews and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm probably more basically like I'll admit I liked what the ideas that Bruce Nesmith were talking about in his uh 
I think it was a college or something like that. He did a, it, oh, a, yeah. a His, talk. He did a conference talk in Vancouver where he explained Radiant AI. Or not, ra yeah. Radiant Story. Radiant Quest, I think it was um, called or something like that, yeah. And uh, his ideas, like the idea of making a Radiant Story, uh, whatever that means, it's marketing, you know, whatever. But a, a dynamic uh, main campaign sounds like the most awesome thing to me. It sounds like a great idea. Obviously, they ran into problems with it, and they decided to kind of drop that and just make it sort of a slightly randomized side quest generator, which is fine. But I kind of consider him, I mean, he's, he goes back all the way to the tabletop RPG days. So he's very much in the mind that RPGs are kind of like digital tabletop RPGs and that there's yes. sort of a dungeon master who is create, helping the player create a story, not a game designer telling the player what their story is. And that's the idea I got from him. Um, also, so I probably have a bias toward him and so i probably inadvertently sort of kind of half blamed emil who's very much a it was my popular story and deal with it yeah because there was that that talk he gave and that did the rounds on uh the gaming news on youtube and so story conference yeah that, yeah, that thing's a disaster so it's very popular to kind of hate emil right now because he's the face of like bethesda's fallout uh, so the odd thing about it was you attribute radiant story to nesmith but in the talk that we watched on stream um it was todd howard who sat down at the fir like the first day of pre-production and basically tasked the design team with coming up with uh radiant story and it was also todd howard who asked if they could do a main quest that was entirely radiant so um he's also in the shot it down I th is he Hang on. It sounded like it. I got to be wrong it. about that. I got. It sounded like it. he was asking questions and kind of inspiring because I don't get oh, the yeah, idea that, that was Todd what they were does a lot about. of the nitty gritty design. I think he's more of like a, hey, let's try this. Hey, I like this. I don't like that. Like he seems like the final approval before it goes upstairs to whomever needs to approve it, you know, in Cinemax or whatever. But it, it, it seems like he's kind of the guy who kind of starts and stops conversations about design ideas but bruce nesmith was the kind of guy who's getting his hands dirty trying to figure this out that's the impression i got yes yeah, so as far as i'm aware todd howard is the the rubber stamp i don't think they actually get approval from for design stuff uh i think he's the top level i'm looking through my notes of that talk um it seemed like it was just getting too complicated and and there's I, also the kind of weird idea that skyrim was rushed which is quite possible it did actually have a pretty short development cycle compared to Morrowind and uh oblivion i think it was three years versus the four or five that the other ones had uh but it seemed like there was just getting too complicated let's just do it scripted let's have a little side quest generator and, and call it done where i think if they had kind of not shot for that 11 11 11 uh release date and try to kind of figure it out more maybe there would have been more of dynamic nature maybe the uh main quest would have had a bit more control uh granted to the player maybe maybe their who they sided with would matter more maybe more agency would be granted upon them or maybe there'd be more things that uh you know uh npcs would would react to and remember i think i think it was in that talk where he talks about uh they had like overdone the reaction system and NPCs. And so like a player would drop an item and like the whole town would like freak out about it and like fight each other over it or something. And it was like, okay, this is too responsive. Let's turn it back. I think that was that talk, wasn't it? Yes. Um, so his kind of point in that section was he was giving a talk to game developers and he was giving them kind of an idea of like the sorts of questions that you want to ask during development when you come up with a system. And so uh, the way he phrase the way he puts it is um, it's a it's a slide called going too far. And it's quotes from development teams of questions they asked that were intentionally bad, but like we're trying to see the limits of Radiant Story. And so the first one was, what if the entire main quest was Radiant from Todd? Uh, and then the second one was the companion should be nothing but radiant quests from Bruce. And then um, he ends the point by saying that going too far is necessary if you want to kind of innovate. 
Yeah. And so it, it's not that Todd shot the idea da down as much as they were looking at what's the logical conclusion of Radiant Story. I can, I can empathize with that. I'm a graphic designer uh, professionally about 16, 17 years. So it's not the same, obviously, but um, I'll propose a design and they'll be like, oh, let's take it further than that. Let's think really out of the box. And generally, when somebody wants a redesign or a refresh or a brand new idea compared to what they've done before, I, I can go out of the box. I'll go like really crazy, like completely different look, you know, different colors, different treatment, different fonts, whatever. And generally, the final approval will be scaled back about 75% from what I went out for. So they want, it, they want something really out there, something really new, but then they'll scale it back to something about 25% different than what what their original brand or look was. And I can kind of see that because you don't want to completely alienate your audience. You don't want to surprise them or be completely un unrecognizable. And even though this is graphic design, it does kind of correlate a little bit to game design because it's still representing your, your brand. You know, you wouldn't want to uh, replace Elder Scrolls with laser guns and uh, dinosaurs and a, a complete first person shooter with no RPG progression or dialogue system. It was just all completely foreign to somebody, you know, when they first play it, they're like, oh, this is, this is Turok. This isn't, you know, this isn't the Elder Scrolls. But uh, my point was like, yeah, it usually gets scaled back quite a bit from when people try to think out of the box. So I can see that as an exercise for sure. If it, uh, you know, using my experience as a graphic designer as, a, as an analogy, I guess. Yeah, I was working on that that thumbnail I posted on Twitter today, and I went through I think six different colors, because I found that that thumbnail from a smaller YouTuber that they had talked about the same game, and it looks so similar, same font, same general premise. Um, they like up the saturation, whereas I up the glow on the on the logo, so I had to recolor it so that it's not like so visually similar, and. Um, I had like a purple version, a yellow version. I don't like the purple version. Colors don't work well. There's a yellow version, but I colors don't work well. There was a green version. The problem with the green version is, is it's a gradient of green, white, and orange, which is the Irish flag. And that would stand out to people. And so I settled on a red version of that thumbnail. But um, yeah, it was a very interesting exercise. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It sometimes that just sucks. Sometimes you accidentally create something that already exists. Um, I remember uh, I came up with, a, with what I thought was a great title for my God game retrospective, which was Playing God. And there was already like a couple of other videos that had that. And then completely unbeknownst to me, uh, uh, Lazy Game Reviews did a video about black and white, which is one of the games I covered in that, in that uh, video. And he said, Playing God. And it's like, I brought it up to him on Twitter. I'm like, I guess it, I thought I was doing the clever title, but I guess it's the obvious title. And he said, yeah, I guess it was. So. Not, not at all a plagiarism or ripping off anybody oh, or anything like that. Yeah. It, just, it, it was the obvious title. It was it. it um, I thought I was clever when uh, the Mandalorian Star Wars show came out. And I'm like, oh, man, Mandalorian. It's like Mandalorian, like the car. And then I Google it. And there's like 5,000 memes of that exact thing online. So like whenever you thought of something that you think is wholly original, most likely it isn't. It's just that's how it, that's how it works. But yeah, I did like that thumbnail and it was a nice treatment. Um, but yeah, one of the biggest examples of coincidence I, I use is that uh, in the 50s, um, there was a U.S. comic created called Dennis the Menace. And on the very exact, in the U.S., yeah, and the exact same day in the U.K., there was a comic published called Dennis the Menace. Like the cosmic coincidence of that is insane, but it was liter literally a coincidence. There was no correlation between the two. So kind of crazy how that works. Yeah, I think people have difficulty kind of wrapping their heads around because that gets into like inspirations and stuff. Um, do you have people who like speculate on who inspired you as a content creator? Because I do. Um, that's a good question. Uh, not too many times. Um, out of curiosity, who inspired you? So who actually inspired me would be uh, to Snakerer. Um, Plague of Gripes and a little bit of Joseph Anderson um, and some Mahler and then like how people th what people think inspired me was just all Mahler all EFAP yeah. and um, I have to tell people like I started the, the stream format that I did for Skyrim 
before I saw any of the episodes of EFAP where they reacted to anything. The only episode I had seen was the John Graham one uh, up to that point. Yeah, that is interesting. I could definitely see more Joseph Anderson in your work than Mueller. Um, and, and you can, it's interesting. It's not, it's not unheard of. Like I use the Tomb Raider series as a good example. You can start out on one path and somebody else kind of borrows from you and then you just realize that they actually did it better than you did and you kind of borrow from them. It, it's like a sort of a symbiotic inspiration that happens a lot actually. Like for example, with the Tomb Raider games, they kind of pioneered the so-called like third person action adventure sort of thing where you're solving puzzles, shooting you know folks with pistols, um, killing endangered creatures for some reason in ancient tombs, stuff like that. And then later on, a game called Uncharted basically did that, but introduced uh, cover, cover based, uh, you know, combat. They introduced uh, more of a, a robust, um, an accessible climbing system, sort of borrowing a little bit from Assassin's Creed. And then later on in the, in the, the uh, Tomb Raider reboot, they totally borrow everything from <laughs> Uncharted. So it's like, um, and from a chain of inspirations. Yeah, it's actually something I allude to a little bit in uh, the last part of, or the, my most recent part of uh, my Cyberpunk video, the, one of the original authors who kind of inspired the uh, cyberpunk genre of William Gibson says something like a cultural osmosis, as he puts it, where he talks about how um, he was inspired by uh, earlier authors and then other authors were, were inspired by him, like Jordan Wiseman, who created the Shadowrun games. He borrowed directly from Neuromancer and William Gibson, things like that. Um, even the cyberpunk tabletop RPG borrowed from earlier works and then other things borrowed from them. It just kind of goes around and around and around. And if you just if you label everything as plagiarism or you've not invented anything original, you don't know how narrative works. I think that you could trace everything back to uh, Greek plays, the Bible, and probably cave paintings if you look yeah, like, back enough, you know. Uh, the story of Gilgamesh and stuff like that, yeah. Absolutely. So, like, who inspired you as a content creator? What are your kind of biggest uh, sources Probably originally, I, I'd actually met um, Total Biscuit uh, at a panel back in Dragon Con years ago, and uh, before he, after he was diagnosed, but unfortunately uh, before his tragic death. And he re was my favorite YouTuber at the time, and and I watched every video he did. He was an incredible speaker, and was able to do like a forty-five minute uh, diatribe about a particular topic. Perfect, not a single, you know, stutter or. Well, that was loss his, of track or anything like that. That, that was, was his thing main was, thing was the WTF is series where it was just off the cuff first impressions. They were was, better than most scripted videos. Yeah, yes. it was incredible. He was he had an amazing talent and I really liked his coverage and his uh, standard and he actually uh, instilled in me some ideas and I didn't probably follow them perfectly at the beginning, but I try to adhere to them now and just like, you know, uh, disclosing things. If you have affiliations with anything like whenever he was a uh, Kickstarter backer, he'd always preface his review with that. Whenever he had any sort of business association with anything he covered, he would always disclose that. He was very ethical in that regard. Um, but honestly, my style is nothing like his at all. Uh, I kind of just did my own thing. I I thought I was doing something original by my, my first scripted video was a, a pretty terrible documentary about the Doom series, and I didn't know how to do voiceover. I didn't really even know how to do much video editing. I kind of learned all that as I went along. But uh, eventually after that, I saw, I was like checking the stats on it and I searched uh, Doom Retrospective and then I found uh, Xbox Ahoy's hour long Doom Retrospective, which is, he's like one of the top video game creators, I think in the world ever. He's fantastic. He does really excellent, uh, deep toned, uh, emphatic and very, He's very careful with his words and his voiceover and everything like that. He has extremely tight editing. He will actually custom animate segments, um, sometimes in 3D, uh, sometimes in 2D animation, uh, his, and often score the entire soundtrack of each of his videos as well and sell that as, as a separate thing. He did put so much work into his, his presentation. It was insane. And that actually made me want to quit because I realized there's no way I'd ever get anywhere close to that quality. Uh, comparing my first Doom retrospective to his uh, hour-long Doom like documentary, basically. But um, 
I think eventually I didn't obviously borrow his style, but I was inspired to do better, you know, to work on my voiceover delivery, which took a while, uh, sound quality, um, sound levels, music choice, presentation, visual interest, all that kind of stuff and in depth, uh, and succinct writing, which, you know, I'm still working on. I try to improve with each video, but, uh, I did, wasn't so much inspired him at the beginning, but I definitely tried to aspire to that level of quality for sure. Yeah, the way you beat Retro Ahoy is uh, you upload more frequently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I can tell you from just the stuff that, I mean, you you would obviously know from the stuff you do too, just like it can take a long time. And the more, like, imagine scoring your videos too. Just that yes. alone would add an, an immense amount of time. <laughs> yeah, it would, be, it would be nice. And I've thought about getting into it before because it gives you a lot more control over yeah. the sound of your video but it's just not a skill set i can pick up right now yeah there's tools for like generating music and basic uh background beats and and rhythms and things like that that'll get you a pretty good like sort of like an underscore if that's the correct word like just a sort of uh accompaniment but yeah if you wanted to get really in depth and really do it that you're you're basically especially for videos of your length or you know eight 12 hours or whatever that would be just be an incredible amount of additional mm -hmm. work i wouldn't necessarily recommend it i i use a lot of different sources now i've kind of moved away from youtube's free music um i try to use licensed subscriptions for multiple reasons one uh if i if i license music that automatically gets claimed if it's not uh, registered to me then that kind of is nice a little bit of copyright protection because if somebody steals my video they can't just post it and make money off of it right so that's kind of nice but also just i don't like i i hate when people just like uh comment on my video and say oh you're using so and so youtubers theme and i'm like god damn it <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's distracting it'd be like if you're watching uh you know the matrix 4 and all of a sudden the avengers theme kicks in you'd be very distracted so i yeah i try to I try to avoid uh, overused music and, and I spend I actually spend months sometimes just coming up with uh, track lists for some of my videos. It's it's quite a I put a lot of time into it. Hopefully it pays off. So the biggest uh, the, the biggest thing I notice that bothers me is uh, Hotline Miami music. Yeah, <laughs> because it always stands out and then I have to track down what the song is. And it's always in videos that doesn't credit the song. Yeah, I, I I haven't looked at your uh, video descriptions, but I've actually run the run the character count on my video descriptions, so now I've actually had to create uh, full yeah, on Google too. documents with all my sources, all my footage used, all my music, everything like that. And I still need to go back and do that for my God Game video because there's a lot of uh, YouTube uh, YouTube free music. I I don't need to credit, but I should because I I respect the creators who create the music, and I've actually helped like send people back and buy you know check out and listen to and buy their music i have a whole playlist with all the available music on spotify for my cyberpunk series that i'd link people to you know try to really send it back because even though i i have license to it and i don't need to credit them i still want to send it back to them because hey i get so many freaking comments about it and i am sick of people asking about what's the song at 46 22 or what's right. the song at uh, two hours and 10 seconds so but uh, also i just you know it anything i use i try to i try to in some small way you know flow power back to them because they helped make this thing i did so i've always been a bit sad i did a lot i put a lot of work into the music for the daedra section in my oblivion video and very few people notice or comment on it but each daedric prince had a song from different games that i would use uh, that's the only time in the oblivion video i used music not from elder scrolls i noticed it immediately that's because yeah you know score my i spend a lot of time picking like different songs and stuff like that for my videos try not to use uh like if my video is five hours long i don't want to use the same six ten songs from the game over and over and over again yep i it's weird how the things you think everybody's going to comment on nobody notices and the things that uh, are pretty obvious everybody's like what's this what's this like i i get i've probably gotten about 50 to 100 comments asking me what the uh, opening credits song is on Cyberpunk Part 2. And not only is it spoken loudly, it's th literally the chorus, but also I have it on screen, <laughs> on the in the video, credit, you know, opening song, yeah. Empire of Steel. And the chorus is, this Empire of Steel. And it's just, <laughs> right. how do you miss that? <laughs> yeah, just look up the lyrics. That's that's usually how I find music. Shazam. I have lyrics 
yeah, I, I actually wrote the lyrics with little music notes in the the closed captioning as well. And nobody like he was like, I can't find this song, man. It's, it's elusive. <laughs> it's like, listen to it. It's funny. Did you? I, I got a question for you. Did you ever get picked up for um, uh, like copyright claims and stuff for video clips you've used? Because oh, you all use, the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh god. Yeah, I saw when you were I saw when you were playing Blade Runner that you had like the you had it rotating like 3d and i think that that was probably a copyright reason wasn't it um yeah there's a i probably shouldn't say it out loud too much because it's it's kind of the a cheat code but basically um audio or visual from a movie longer than six seconds like six to seven seconds I, isn't that well claimed. known maybe yeah but it, i was doing that on the stream was timing how long i could play something and not get the stream claimed yeah, it's it's pretty tricky. Um, there, yeah, I do a lot of subtle editing. Like anytime I have to, I have to show a, uh, a, a audio clip from a movie. I have to do a bunch of uh, tomfoolery to get it to actually go through, because sometimes I'll, I'll want to show a 20, se uh, 20 or thirty second scene or whatever, you know, to give the context. I'll have to edit the dialogue and move like this sentence before that sentence, um, or chain like replace the visuals of that segment with another part of the scene and basically re-edit the scene completely uh, and seamlessly without changing the actual meaning or context of the scene. And people probably don't realize I do that much to it, but uh, yeah, you have to really dance around it. And it's not only does it uh, dodge the content ID system, but it also fulfills the legal requirement of uh, transformative content because that's no longer the scene that you see in the movie. So it's 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 a huge pain, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to covering. Copyright's a tart a topic of itself. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back to just covering video games because for the most part, except for a couple weird songs here and there, video games won't get claimed. Just or be careful with trailers. Yeah, or occasionally you get automated like uh, claims for a cutscene by a big gaming channel. It's complete BS, but yeah, that'll occasionally happen. Then. I haven't had that. I got claimed by Activision for a cutscene from a Call of Duty game. That's pretty wild. I, I haven't covered the Call of Duty games in any detail, so I haven't tried that. But yeah, that it sucks. Sometimes you'll get big YouTubers that'll claim a video from you because you you put in a cutscene that everybody gets. And that's just like, oh, that's stupid. Oh, yeah. And you're having problems with uh, zero punctuation, too, as well, right? Yeah, that one finally cleared up. But I'm still, okay. still claiming... I never disputed it. The Harry Partridge clip... Uh, I got claimed by his company, and then um, finally, I had to play like a Last Jedi scene for like thirty seconds just because I wanted, <laughs> I wanted a big corporation to claim me because it felt wrong that I had two claims from YouTubers, or you know, yeah. internet content creators at least, and not from like actual movie companies. Yeah, the creepiest thing that I got was I, I now am paranoid as hell. So any music from any video game, even, uh, I'll now uh, create a dummy video and just stick the music behind a flat mm, yes. uh, still image and just upload that and test it. Um, I'll also individually test any um, movie or TV show clip. Yes, anything, I, anything that could get claimed, I've tested on my second channel. Yeah, I even tested on my main channel, just unlisted, because nobody will see that. But um, yeah, no, I, I test all that stuff uh, because I found some cr crazy stuff. I was testing, um, I was trying to get something that sounded like Blade Runner, and uh, music-wise. And I grabbed uh, music from the 1997 Blade Runner game. And, and in case you've not watched my video, uh, Blade Runner, when it was being produced, the original movie got into a bunch of like m m uh, financial problems and... They kind of sold their rights amongst like three or four companies. That's why you see so many logos at the beginning of the movie. Basically, it's a complete uh, legal nightmare to get the rights to the movie. And that's why the sequel was not made for so long also. But the game, uh, essentially, the uh, composer had to listen to the movie soundtrack and recompose it by ear <laughs> completely from scratch. And so the compositions in the 1997 Blade Runner game is actually completely original Uh you know, or completely composed and produced originally without anything from the actual film. So I was like, okay, that should be fair game, right? So I, I, I tested some of those clips from the Blade Runner game and they were getting claimed as covers of the Blade Runner movie. And I realized they implemented some sort of system where you can 
use a cover of a popular song and it'll it'll either have that cover registered or it will detect the notes somehow um people have whistled and i think gotten claimed i think i heard that yes uh that's insane to me but somehow it actually detects the notes so i had to then uh basically go to various uh royalty free music websites and find not terminator music not blade runner music right it sounds very very similar stylistically but isn't the same and that was fine that got cleared just fine but uh yeah and then crazily enough the end title credits music for blade runner was registered as a cover uh no actually straight up it was identified as Ra raiders of the lost ark <laughs> the only connection between that uh blade runner and raiders of the lost ark is the actor Completely different yeah, movies, that's completely so different weird. Studios. Yeah, it's insane. I have no idea why. So, uh, do you guys have any questions before I bring up the final topic? Um, I'm just interested in, uh, like, why do why do you why, why do you go in like so deep into um like your editing process and stuff like that? Because your documentaries and stuff, I look at it and I I look at like a 30 second clip and it's like that had to have taken like two weeks to put together. Well, sometimes um, I think roughly I between the, the recording, the gameplay, sourcing clips, finding uh, still images, animating, uh, after effects, editing, voiceover, etc. I think I for the cyberpunk series uh, on average, about 10 hours of work goes into every minute of video, something like that. Um, so you can do the math about 1400 hours for a feature length to an hour, 50 minute video, I think roughly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, part of that's just me being really painstaking and time consuming, but it's also just like, sometimes I'm, I'm stuck with a five minute segment about a book and I have no visuals. I have five covers of the book. I can't just show five covers of the book. I can't just show the text cause that's boring. So I try to actually, I'm almost like making a, an audio book, uh, visual novel <laughs> or visualized version of the novel in some cases where I'm like recreating the scenes as I imagine them in the book with like stock footage and, and uh, sometimes original artwork very rarely um, or animation or layering various uh, sources on top of one another. Sometimes it's a bit from the uh, cover artwork. Sometimes it's a bit from the inside of the book. Sometimes it's just completely original and it, recoloring it, making sure I have license rights to it, all that kind of stuff. So that stuff's the most time consuming. Um, otherwise, it's just finding the relevant clips for every single segment. Like I, I, I've tried to, I try to make the visual speak, tell the story on its own, even without the, the uh, narrative or the voiceover. So like what you see what you're seeing is what i'm saying it should be at least every second of the video for the most part so it would make sense to someone who is like esl uh i'm actually not familiar with that term esl uh english is a second language oh okay yeah sure yeah i mean i got a lot of foreign viewers uh, probably about half my viewers are are from outside of uh english-speaking countries actually so that's probably due to that maybe my videos tend to kind of work better for that because they get a lot of um visualization and they don't have to rely completely on the on the language maybe but uh that was actually going to be my question was do you how valuable do you feel that is in a youtube world in which we know that a lot of people just listen to long form content like that and don't watch it at all yeah like your, um, your two hour video how much effort is going into that um, I mean, visually. about 14, no, I mean, 14, so, sorry, so, so this, yeah, so it's the same, but kind of our, our point is, um, past 45 minutes, do you think people are still watching the documentary or are they just listening to it? I certainly hope so because otherwise I'm wasting my life away. You don't get the, <laughs> you don't get the, um, the comments that say like, wow, I really love listening to your videos while I'm doing chores. Or falling asleep. <laughs> oh God, I get this all the time, and I'm like, "Is my voice really boring?" <laughs> but uh, I, I, there's some people who kind of really set a time. Like I, I get those comments at the beginning. It's like, "Oh man, I've got my evening set out for me." You know, like, I've got to put on my big TV. Even somebody tweeted out uh, with their my video on their big screen TV and with their friends and saying, oh, "I'm watching this weird documentary about cyberpunk. Kind of cool." 
And somebody else replies like, hey, that's Indigo Gaming's video. And I'm like, that's trippy. But uh, so I know that there's some people who definitely watch it. Um, there's some people who uh, criticize it. Like I think one person said in my last video, it's like that person was actually a bicyclist, not a motorbike, motor, motorcyclist. You know, did you even read the book? And I'm like, OK, well, I got that wrong. Thanks. Uh, did you watch the other fucking two hours? <laughs> But, uh, you know, people are, uh, one thing I noticed about comments is that people are just like shouting at the wall. You know, they don't ex necessarily expect anybody to hear them. They just want to, uh, you know, uh, basically, you know, make their grievances known, even if it's just bouncing off at the, at the wall. That, so I don't really blame commenters for things like that, but it is a little frustrating when somebody will pick apart a 20,000 word script and say, oh, I, you pronounced this word wrong. I don't know if you ever get that, but oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. I, although sorry, I, did I do, I, your question? I, I do it intentionally, though. Uh, yes, you basically believe that um, a lot of people are going to be still watching the video after the forty-five minute mark. Whereas um, our philosophy is, uh, me and private sessions is that past a certain point, you're going to lose people, you're going to lose the visual viewers, and you're just going to have listeners, and so it gains a podcast like element where um the audio is the primary focus that is interesting like i, I definitely have that I, I know exactly what you're talking about like i i'll quite often listen to efap for example um or back when uh total Bisco was live he had a podcast with various uh guests and stuff like that i didn't need to see what was going on i could just listen to it so an audio form was perfectly fine I do put a lot of effort into the audio editing, like, you know, music cues and stuff to kind of keep the pacing. And, and, uh, you know, if I feel like I've gone on for a bit long, I try to like rekindle interest by doing like a, a loud music sting or something like that. There's like, I, I don't really, I can't really document how I do things, but I, there's a method to my madness, I guess. Uh, so I think it, it's perfectly functional audio wise, but I think that you get a lot more of the, uh, a lot more comp it really aids comprehension and entertainment value if you watch it so either one really is fine i've gotten i think one recommendation that somebody'd rather ha watch it in on an audio podcast like on spotify or something but um i think that demonstrating uh demonstrating what you're talking about on screen especially when you're talking about like game mechanics that's really really useful because sometimes you might explain something it's like oh damage threshold so and so whatever but until you visualize that, that this guy took you down from full health to death in one hit, do you really realize what I'm like the gravity of what I just said? Well, yeah, that's, so I think that that's my philosophy is if there's an element where um, it has to be demonstrated visually, then the visuals will be relevant. And usually the visuals are relevant anyways. I say that like I primarily make it for audio consumption. But I mean, I still put the effort to have the visual on screen related to what I'm talking about. I just don't put a lot of effort into like After Effects, you know, uh, visual editing. Yeah, and honestly, all that stuff is just um, me flexing um, graphic design skills, basically. Like, I just find a cross section uh, that I could, like, I try to figure out what can I offer that isn't as readily accessible to other people. I'm a graphic designer. I like talking about video games, and I like holding on, you know, partitioning parts of my brain off to random trivia about old stuff that nobody cares about. So like I find like a little kind of cross section of that in sort of video game retrospectives that are well presented. So um, I just I figure that presentation is one of the things I can do that may kind of get me noticed or remembered above others. So that's what was kind of my my niche, I guess. So you, but, you, would, uh, you would say if your channel fell apart tomorrow, you could still pitch yourself based on the things that you've created as a graphic artist. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, by fall apart, how do you mean? Just like. Uh, but like, let's say that just tomorrow your channel vanished and nobody noticed, right? So, but you still have your content. So like, if you wanted to go work for a company, you could just say, hey, I made these. And it would be a good yeah. advertisement for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I even used my channel in my last resume, uh, showing that I, I was fairly successful in uh, multimedia and, you know, uh, creating content that, you know, millions of people had seen. So... Yeah, I, I could definitely see that you uh, being used as a resume or even just clips of it putting into a demo reel or something like that for sure. Um, but it would be a little bit more difficult to pitch that if it was just random clips from video games. 
So, yes. you know, uh, it wasn't really my, my uh, motivation behind it, but sure, now you mention it, sure, why not? So you were going to ask something private? Uh, I was just going to say, um, from my perspective, like, you know, your editing's really good, by the way. Uh, but what I noticed with um, the Cyberpunk video and also your God Games video is that you do a very good job at giving, like, a very... Um, unbiased uh, overview of like an entire genre and stuff and that in of itself I believe is very niche and very marketable yeah it's kind of a new thing I've gotten into in the last couple of years um, I it may have partially been inspired now that I think about it in retrospective the fact that I started getting into game development under the uh, you know with the whole once lost thing I think I kind of felt in a way that I was being too critical especially if I was going to start making games as well so that may have been part of the reason why i started getting more uh objective with my um videos a bit getting less uh opinion driven and stuff like that so like uh, my my earlier videos were definitely more critical and probably a lot of the arguments were more flawed because of that because i was mostly just expressing feelings and and my personal experience rather than uh hard facts i mean i did try to back it up with hard facts like i think that uh, especially with the Elder Scrolls one, I kind of mentioned very specific mechanics that were added or taken away. Whether those were added or removed um, to good or uh, poor results, that's completely debatable. But I tried to get the skills and specific mechanics that were removed at specific points right and spent a long time, you know, looking at charts and tables and like, okay, at this point, this was taken out. At this point, you know, this was the size. And at this point, you know, the game world was. 22 kilometers or you know square kilometers whatever i try to get those details right i may have flubbed to here and there but um i think that when i was getting into god game stuff i pretty much liked all the games i covered save for like maybe goddess because that game never was never finished uh but for the most part i just like i didn't really need to express i actually do express my opinion here and there just talking about how like it feels like you know you're running an anthill and you know like a you know the joy of teaching your creature how to eat and you know what to eat and how to play with you know pigs and stuff like that it feels like you're raising a child like that's a bit subjective but um i realized if i just get just fact matter of fact gets a little dry after a while so but um yeah i wanted to make something that wasn't just complete opinion piece and actually had a lot of uh sources and and little known data you know just kind of because you know when you put too much opinion into something it kind of becomes more controversial which honestly drives up views but i was my intention wasn't to be you know uh controversial or well watched my my opinion my objective was to make something that was fairly timeless and a really good primer for say god games in general or like the doc uh, cyberpunk documentary where i just wanted to introduce people who may have not ever known or may have forgotten the true origins of the genre so hopefully that came through so since you brought it up i was gonna ask the last thing as um about the article that you had written uh, on Once Lost Games. Um, not any particular questions about it, just sort of has your perspective changed and is there anything kind of new looking back on it now about that article? As far as I know, 99% of that article is uh, factual. Um, obviously, come from my perspective, I was pretty bitter. I'd put a couple grand or maybe even somewhere between two to three thousand dollars into the project. I had flown uh, to another state to meet in person, uh, rented a car, you know, expenses paid, whatever, to try to bang that out in kind of a desperate attempt to save the project. Um, I'd done hundreds of hours of work on IT, graphic design, meetings, etc., to no real avail. And I was pretty bitter by the end of it, so it probably came out a bit fresher, even though I did write it two, two months after I had left. Um, but in retrospective, I probably shouldn't have published that article. Um, I, I don't regret it necessarily, but it probably makes me look unprofessional more so than uh, I probably would have looked had I just kind of honorably left and stayed silent about it i would i get incessant questions even today about the project even on live streams of saying like oh what a, you know i'm glad you're working on so-and-so project and um unfortunately 
I would answer truthfully on stream because my streams on my second channel are pretty small. You usually don't get above like 20 to 40 viewers at a time. But uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the other co-founders uh, saw my stream and got pissed and started texting me over <laughs> phone <laughs> saying, he's like, I'm so angry at what you're saying. And like, why are you trying to, you know, destroy your project? And I'm like, that's not what I'm trying to do. But I, I yeah, so I'm not really on speaking terms with anybody at the moment. Um, but yeah, I, and, but like I said, I, I think I comment on the video. It's not unlisted, I think, but I, the cat's out of the bag, so I can't really take it back. So I now just leave it up as something I said, something I did, and I refer people to search Indigo Gaming Medium if they have any questions about why I left the project. And that, that was like a 10 to 15,000 word article, so it's pretty comprehensive. And if you don't know why I left at the end of that, then I don't know what to say. <laughs> right. Yeah, you kind of basically touched on everything I kind of want to talk about, like the um, the professionalism of it, how it makes you look. Um, I guess you haven't really... Have you done anything where you, you've had to get an interview with somebody where that might have created an issue for you? I've not really reached out to do any interviews after that. Um, I don't think it would be a problem if I were to reach out to people for an interview. Um uh, but honestly, the interviews I've done um, were a ton of work and um, cynically just uh, I could do a lot more uh, scripted work and get a lot more viewership and, and channel growth. Mm -hmm. So the, I did it because I, I, I reached out and found uh, Julian um, because I really, really respected his work and wanted his story to be known. And I left those up because I think that regardless of what happened after, those still stand true as great little bits of history that aren't really touched upon. Like you can't really find an interview uh, before that about either of them to any great extent. Like they had been pretty much um, unknown to that point for the most part. There's a couple little blurbs here and there with Ted, but Julian was very, very uh, obscure. So I'm glad I did that and I left those. I'm not going to delete those videos or take those down because I think they're great give a great perspective on how the games were developed and obviously those interviews happened well before any talks of a game with them were being made so i still think they stand up uh, they stand as perfectly fine uh if somebody did ask me about um what happened with the other thing i'm like yeah i, I learned a lot i made some mistakes i probably shouldn't have gone public about it but um i'm not going to erase it pretending that it didn't happen well and i still get questions about it today and so I refer to people to that article if they have any questions. And I know that archive.org does uh, exist. So even if I were to take it down, people would still have access to it. Yeah, so. I was going to say, I have it I have it archived. Not anything personal against you. I archive everything. <laughs> I uh, archive stuff too, yeah. Yeah, I was kind of looking at it from a perspective of, is this a mistake that we should learn from? And you seem to have basically said that, yes, uh, this, this is something that if we ever worked on a project uh, not to do if we have a falling out, I think the the Ross Scott approach to uh, writing an article about your experience is a lot better. If you've never if you've ever read his write up on his time with Machinima, I haven't. No, um, I tried to keep my emotions out of it. Mostly, obviously, a bias came through. Um, I partially like my ideal would be a bit more of a post mortem rather than a this is what we messed up. <laughs> My idea was to say, "Hey, don't go, don't fall, us, don't fall down these uh, traps. Um, don't, don't do what I did and think you can make a game on a once a week meeting uh, alone. And make sure you have the time investment before ever thinking about doing something anywhere near this uh, ambitious." So that was my intent. It did kind of have a little bit of ranting and stuff, but I believe everything I wrote in there is true. There were a couple minor details that I had to correct after the fact that somebody brought up, but um, and I think that uh, Ted Peterson said on Discord that he disagreed with some points, but never got into any specifics. So I don't know what I got wrong or disagreed or, but the fact that nobody's really rebuked anything shows that I probably got most of it right. So would you say it's good? It's a good thing to write, but to maybe sit on. So like you should have written it at the time, but then you just held on to it. Um, until like maybe the game came out or there was some development. Would that be a better yeah. way to do it? 
and I could have been a lot more mean about it. I could also have monetized it. I didn't. It's on. It's my only. It's my only article on an unmonetized medium art uh, page. I literally just wrote it to kind of get it off my chest, and so people had an explanation because I had to then go back to the Daggerfall Unity forums and say, "Hey, I'm no longer with the pro uh, with this project. Here's why. Um, if you need to contact them, go into their Discord." And I had to basically separate myself from it because I was getting daily questions. But if I wanted to, I could have turned it into a whole hot, juicy right. video topic Spilling that would have tea. gotten probably probably would have gotten tens or hundreds of thousands of views. And I could have really squeezed it for what it's worth. But I, I, I just wanted to get the information out there and as sort of a warning, like, don't make my mistakes. Don't do this. Well, again, I'm not probing it as for um, like it could have happened to anybody. It's sort of a, like if I got screwed over in that way, should I write the article and then not publish it and then just sit on it? That was kind of the perspective I was taking. Cause uh, yeah, obviously you could have made it messy and uh, trailer trashy kind of drama. So um, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that comprehensively kind of, kind of covers it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I could have, I did wait two months. Um, I never, I had to back up every single file we'd ever done and individually back them up on a, on a Amazon web server, uh, folder and individually send them to each person, all their backup emails and stuff, because nobody even took over billing, um, for the web server. I was doing all the IT. I was doing all the accounting. I was doing all the, everything for the project, basically, uh, technology wise. And so I had to manually send package up all those things over the next couple of months and leave them up on my own account on my expense. And nobody even got back to me <laughs> uh, from management at least. So I was pretty bitter at that point. I'm like, okay, I need to get this off my chest. I'm pretty not okay with how this ended. If it was a smoother uh, end, like it's like, hey, we understand, no hard feelings. Uh, let us know how we can take over all this stuff and you know, we'll part ways nicely. I probably would have been Probably would never even written that article, to be honest. But it was a pretty rough, uh, just complete lack of respect and uh, uh, res uh, proper communication at the end. So I pretty, I felt pretty bitter. I think that was probably my main, uh, my main reason for writing it. But yeah, in retrospect, I probably should have sat on it and then made it more of a, uh, hey, I worked on an indie project that did not go well. Um, here are some things to avoid or some uh, things you can look for in terms of commitment before uh, really setting yourself up for a years long project. I think that would have been a better, a better read and would have come off more professionally. So that in retrospective, yeah, if I would have sat on it a bit longer, rewritten it and made it a bit more of a, uh, uh, like a postmortem, I think right. it would have been better. So um, before we kind of end this, uh, I, I was gonna ask, cause you've been getting around a couple different shows now. Um, why the sudden increase in appearances? Um, uh, free time mostly. Uh, I have a full time job, um, nine to nine to six every weekday. So I've had a, cu a couple bouts of PTO. I finished my big video, so um, kind of coasting on the end of year increase in views before everything goes to a calamitous drop in January. <laughs> right, uh, right. So, um, yeah, so it's like no rush to finish a video until, you know, things pick up because otherwise your video may just may not get, get watched. So, uh, mostly free time though, but I, I've been on quite a few podcasts. I've been on nerd slayers, uh, podcasts like four or five times. I've been interviewed by s a couple people. Um, I was on Z uh, Zarek Zahakaran's uh, channel. He think he commented on a couple of your videos. He's yes. really, really knowledgeable about lore, by the way. If you ever want... I've talked a, to him uh, before lore, on stream. Yeah, Lorebeard. He's he's a great, really, really, uh, like, thousands of hours in the games and stuff. So he's really good about that. Um, and I've been on EFAP, like, I think 10 times or something. So I've it's not completely new to me. And I do have my own very, 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 very rare <laughs> podcast that I kind of do occasionally. I get people together, so... Might want to might try to squeeze another one of those out pretty soon, but uh, mostly just having free time because people quite often have very weird openings. Like I think Nerd Slayer has like uh, like Monday mornings or something, so it's 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 weird. Yeah, uh, working around everybody's get... schedules. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm still a wage slave, so I still have to 
work to pay the bills on top of my channel. So maybe that'll change one day. We'll see. Right. Um, yeah. So I think that was a good episode too. I'm going to wrap it up there and say that that's that. Uh, thanks. Do we want to do the, uh, we got one question yeah. from a, from a viewer this week. Did, do you have it? Yeah, I do. All right, go ahead and ask it. Yeah. So, uh, Ember Synth on YouTube asks, uh, what is your least favorite design trope in a video game? Oh, that's a good one. Man, I wish I was prepared for that. Um, least favorite design trope? Probably um, off the top of my head, railroad walking slash uh, on rail sections where you can't you can't skip past the dialogue or cutscene section, but you have to like walk or very slowly move along with several of their characters um, because they wanted to make a uh, dialogue sequence interactive. You can't do anything but simply walk at their pace. Like I think uh, Red Dead use, does this a lot, where you're like mm -hmm. riding alongside people. God of War, uh, Halo Reboot Three does that a bit. Halo Three, yeah. A lot of these games kind of do it. Um, it's just a kind of uh, unnecessary waste of time i don't like non-interactive gameplay if that makes sense like if you're actually in control you should be in control if you are essentially in a cutscene, it should be skippable that's probably best way to summarize that um i, I figure what are your feelings it, on the half-life 2 approach to this oh you mean where like they kind of put yeah well they kind of put like interactable crap <laughs> all around the place so that during the the dialogue you can entertain yourself if you want but it's also not skippable yeah, I mean, that's a, that's as far as back as the early, the first Half-Life game where you were always in first person and always in control. That's a cool idea. Um, and almost always moving. There was no, like, sit down and listen, except for, like, right before you go to Zen, I guess. Yeah, um, I'm not the hugest fan of Half-Life 2. I think it's a good game, but I, I don't have the deep love that a lot of people have about the game. I think it's a solid game. There's some sequences that are frustrating, but I... Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of just just uh, let's sit down and talk for 10 minute sequences. I kind of think there's probably a better way to get that uh, to pace that out or to get that uh, exposition across more dynamically. Um, I don't like Half-Life's world and storytelling or Half-Life 2's world and storytelling. And Alex inherited a lot of those problems. Yeah, I haven't played Alex yet. I need to get my Oculus back up and running, but um, I've heard it's good but i honestly have not played it um so, so i'll answer the question um not being able to access the settings before you start the game <laughs> like no man oh, that's no man's a, sky that's you have to one. you have to load into no man's sky to access the settings thankfully i already had a save so i just loaded up the old save and did it but the first time you play no man's sky you're like dying on the surface of some inhospitable planet while you're like trying to figure out your graphics settings. Um, I really hate that. It's a I nice agree. way to kill the immersion. Cold cold opens are good for movies, but not for video games. You should always have settings before you play. Yeah, because um, you know, there's basic stuff like, oh, what if you want mouse inversion? You know, you, you don't really have that with movies. I uh, this is kind of funny uh, because. I think I'm the only person here that plays consistently on console and I've always really enjoyed uh, when a game doesn't have a title screen the first time you boot it up. Uh, but I also don't have to worry about settings as much because I'm on a console. So uh, I think that's, uh, I've never really thought about that before. Yeah. It's a big thing on PC with how many different hardware configurations there are um, getting everything running. Like I had to get, uh, Star Wars Movie Battles 2 running, and that's a game that's difficult to install. It's a mod for Jedi Academy, but um, yeah, it, it wouldn't work on a console because it's really volatile. So, uh, Private, do you have a least Force. favored design? Force turret sections. Yes. So, yeah, th that's all like stereotypes and it's a shame you still see that kind of stuff. Mass but, Effect yeah, 3. Yeah. So bad with it. Yeah, uh, like one cure I actually saw to the Maya one was, I think I even saw it in Borderlands or some other like rando game like that where 
I, it only really works, I think, in uh, modern or sci-fi games with where radios are a thing, where they'd actually, you could walk up to somebody, talk to them, and they'd start their conversation, but you could just run off or drive off. And as soon as you get out without, outside their uh, um, hearing reach, they would switch to radio and talk to you over radio. And I, you could kind of go on and do your own thing while they blabber on. I, still a little annoying, but that was at least better because c- uh, you could at least go on and play the game instead of just having to wait for them to finish. So that's like a nice alternative if you have to have that much exposition. So, yeah, be sure to, to check back. Uh on the next episode um you'll probably have seen a video on my channel before this podcast comes out um does anybody else have anything in the works soonish? ish um, a mass effect 3 video will be done in like another couple weeks i've got a three hour long video that's coming out before january 1st nice all righty uh yeah let's just end this Alrighty, well, thanks it's been for fun LARPing. <laughs> that should be our closing line every time. Yeah, it's a stupid name, but it's funny to say. It's going to stick. You know it is. <laughs>